So we're going to continue the conversation in terms of what are some of the solutions that are needed to build a climate resilient future. And we're going to be looking specifically at America. So next up is our climate security plan for America, moderated by Leanne Bryan, an, an analyst at International Technology and Trade Associates, which is an international policy and business consulting firm. She's a fellow with the Atlantic Council's Women, Women's Leaders in Energy Program and a volunteer events manager with the Young Professionals in foreign policy. Leanne is a 2021 graduate of the George Washington University's Master of Arts in International, in International Affairs program. So Leanne, if you're there, over to you. Hi, thank you for that introduction. For today's session, we will hear from our distinguished panel with time towards the end for Q&A. Conference participants can post their questions in the chat and we will try to get to them all. We will con conclude our session at 2.30 Mountain Time or 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. So it looks like there is a little bit of lag on my end. Can someone let me know if I'm coming in clearly or not? You're coming in clearly, Leanne. Okay, great. So to begin, I would like to introduce, firstly, Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn. Vice Admiral McGinn is a member of the Center for Climate and Security Advisory Board and a senior member of the Executive Committee at the International Military Council on Climate and Security. He served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, Installations and Environment from September 2013 until January 2017. In this role, he led the transformation of naval installations toward um, a greater mission of resiliency through energy efficiency, renewable energy, microgrids, and other technologies. Previously, Admiral McGinn served, McGinn served as the United States Navy served in the United States Navy for 35 years as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Requirements and Programs, and previously commanded the U.S. Third Fleet. While in the Navy, he served as a naval aviator, test pilot, aircraft carrier, commanding officer, and uh, national security strategist. Admiral Begin. McGinn is a former president of the American Council on Renewable Energy, the past co-chairman of the CNA Military Advisory Board, and has been an international senior fellow at the Rocky Mountain Institute. Moving on, I would like to introduce another panel member, Lieutenant General John Castella. Um, General John Castella is a member of the Center for Climate and Security's Advisory Board. He is also the president of the Crockett Policy Institute, a nonpartisan policy and research organization chartered in Tennessee. Castella served in the Marines for 36 years, holding several operational commands and flying more than two dozen different aircraft. His duties included service with the UN during the siege of Sarajevo, command of the U.S. Joint Force in Multinational Security and Stability Operations in East Timor, and as the Chief of Staff for the U.S. Central Command during the Iraq War. His last tours on active duty were in the Pentagon, where he first oversaw Marine aviation and then the Marine Corps budget creation and execution. He is on the National Security Advisory Council of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, the board of the American Security Project, and is a teaching fellow in the College of Business and Global Affairs at the University of Tennessee, Martin. And moving on to our last panelist, panelist uh, Dr. Marcus King. Uh, Dr. King is a John O. Rankin Associate Professor of International Affairs and Director of the George Washington University's Master of Arts in International Affairs program. As a professor, Dr. King draws on experience in public service, academia, and the private sector. He previously served as the Elliott School Director of Research. His expertise, teaching, and scholarship are in the area of environmental and energy security. Dr. King's research uh, 
focuses on climate change impacts, including water stress on fragile states in the Middle East and Africa. He joined George Washington's Elliott School from the research staff of CNA um, Corporation Center for Naval Analysis. Prior, he held appointments in the office of the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense as a foreign, foreign Affairs Specialist and in the immediate office of the Secretary of Energy. Dr. King is the Vice Chairman of the Council for Strategic Risks and Senior Fellow at the Center for Climate and Security. Now, um, I will turn it over uh, to the Vice Admiral to begin our session on opening remarks. Hey, thank you very much, Leanne. It's great to be uh, with you, especially with such uh, distinguished uh, fellow uh, panelists. Um, General Castello and I both uh, hit, wear the uh, wings of gold of uh, naval aviation, uh, and uh, he and the Marine Corps and me in the, the Navy, but we've been uh, battle buddies in various things uh, over the years, and uh, it's just really great. Marcus uh, King and I um, worked uh, at the CNA Military Advisory Board, where we uh, worked on such reports as climate change and the threat to national security and, and subsequent reports. So go back a long way, and it's just really great to be here with these uh, distinguished Americans. Okay, so climate security plan for America. I'm gonna sum it up in two sentences. One, more energy, less carbon. And second, uh, we need to uh, take the challenges that we are presented by climate change and try to turn them into uh, into great opportunities for economic growth, for quality of uh, life, uh, for personal security. Easy to say, hard to do, complex problems, but effectively what we need to do is to look for opportunities to manage where possible the clean energy transition. So the decarbonization of our energy whether it's uh, energy that is uh, produced for uh, utilities or by utilities for uh, all of the purposes of electricity, whether it's uh, residential and industrial, commercial, military, but to have that decarbonization and that uh, energy transition to a new energy economy take into consideration some very, very key points. We can uh, decarbonize pretty quickly, but if we don't do it in the right way, we can really, really do some damage to our uh, energy security and to our economic security. So we need to be really, really careful as we decarbonize and we do it in a way that uh, takes into consideration uh, energy uh, resilience, energy security or, or reliability, uh, affordability, and uh, also making decisions that uh, produce that energy in a much cleaner way in terms of re reducing uh, the, uh, the cost that we have to, play, have to pay in terms of greenhouse gas production. Across the country, uh, we are dealing with a lot of challenges because of the severe weather effects. And we have been for a number of years that are caused by a, uh, a, a heating up uh, globe. Right now, uh, as we speak uh, in the West, uh, in the Southwest in the United States, record temperatures, uh, not just in cities, but across uh, farmlands and ranches, national parks, etc. Extreme drought, uh, historic drought in many, many cases that uh, uh, increases the danger of wildfires, for example, decreases the availability of an essential clean energy called hydropower, and just really, really creates unbelievable challenges for the production of uh, Things that we eat, the food, uh, food production, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, beef production or whether it's uh, vegetables and fruits or or what ha or grains, so we're seeing it right now. Last winter in Texas, uh, more than a hundred people died because of uh, the effects of climate-related um, incursion of very very record-breaking cold air from a globe from a polar vortex and uh, the failure of many, many parts of our energy production system, people without energy literally for days. And it, uh, it actually resulted in uh, a tremendous loss of life, injuries, hospitalizations, and a tremendous bill in terms of uh, 
uh, the economy and the need to build back things that failed during that uh, polar vortex. Last uh, summer, late last summer around Labor Day, uh, California experienced uh, widespread outages because of a, a similar uh, effect. A big heat dome over the uh, southwest caused a tremendous increase in the demand for electricity, for cooling primarily. And uh, unlike previous uh, more localized uh, heat waves, California didn't have the same ability to call on neighboring states for the importation of electrons that uh, were, were very much needed to beat the uh, excessive demand caused by the heat wave. We can think about uh, some of the, uh, the flooding that has gone on over the past few years, uh, hurricanes in the Gulf uh, affecting uh, our military installations, for example. In 2018, Hurricane Michael came roaring across the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico from south to north and practically destroyed Tyndall Air Force Base. The restoration costs $5 billion. Uh, the same year and the year before, a couple of, uh, of, of hits on Camp Lejeune, major United States Marine Corps uh, base in uh, in North Carolina. Uh, the bill that uh, is the bill for uh, repairing and restoring Camp Lejeune is uh, 3.6 billion dollars in climbing. So this is a very very here and now problem, and we've got to do two things. We've got to make ourselves more resilient to be able to stand up to these, uh, these extreme weather events and, and uh, keep uh, the economy going, keep people safe, et cetera. But at the same time, we need to work on that clean energy transition and be able to produce more electricity with less carbon. I wanna just briefly uh, give you a policy uh, view from, uh, from the Secretary of Defense. Based on the 27 January executive order 14007, signed one week after he assumed office as president by, by uh, President Biden. Um, this executive order was all about uh, dealing with climate change across all branches of government. Here's what uh, General Austin, the Secretary of Defense, said in March. We face a growing climate crisis that is impacting our missions, plans, and capabilities, and must be met by ambitious, immediate action. In line with the president's direction, we will elevate climate as a national security priority, integrating climate considerations into the department's policies, strategies, and partner engagements. We will incorporate climate risk assessments into our wargaming, modeling, and simulation we will bolster mission resilience and deploy solutions that optimize capability and reduce our own carbon footprint. Where possible, we will seek to lead the way for alternative climate-considered approaches to the entire country. That is from uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd Austin, and uh, it is being implemented uh, as we speak. So thank you again for being here. I look forward to uh, participating in and questions and answers and dialogue with my fellow participants. Back to you, Liam. Thank you, Vice Admiral. So next, um, Lieutenant General, your opening remarks, please. Thank you very much. You know, it's always a pleasure for me to fly wing on Admiral again. I've been doing it for over 30 years now. He fly, flew A7s, I flew helicopters, I always have ask him to give me a few knots so he doesn't want to run <laughs> off and leave me. But uh, we'll try to hang with him today. You know, I think all of us have events that bring home uh, truths. Uh, I was in uh, Western Iraq, standing on Ditha Dam, watching a column of Marines come into a secure area. When I saw one of the biggest explosions I've ever seen go off, as an uh, improvised explosive device was cooked off against the column. That column was primarily carrying gas and water. Uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, those convoys did that 70% of the time. The majority of our casualties were incurred during those things. So that is when I started really thinking about energy and the use of and how 
it uh, affected other elements of our operational environment. And that's what we thought about is, is the environment, how we operated, how we carried out the nation's mission that they've given us of fighting and win our battles. And so it became very clear over the years of the impact uh, that climate change uh, was having uh, on our country, on the world, and on our, our security. Uh, you know, there are probably about three things that the uh, military is really good at. One is, is uh, responding when something happens to a crisis because of the capabilities and communications, transportation, and people that we have. Another one is uh, developing uh, what we call the intelligence preparation of the battlefield where we know what the threats are and what's going on. And then the last one is developing technology uh, that we can use. So as my contemporaries, those folks by the name of Mattis, uh, Austin, and Allen have said is the military has a role to play but it's about being able to bring all of the nation's power into play and to coordinating that and to doing those things that are proactive so that we don't have to always default when something happens uh, to the military. And I, let me talk about one area here in the United States uh, that's not military, uh, but it has a tremendous impact on our national security here. And, and that's with our land, with the soil that we tr step on every day. Um, you know, one third of that soil has been degraded uh, because of how we have formed over the years. And also, also because of the uh, extreme events that are starting to occur during, due to climate change. Uh, you know, I, I live on my farm here in Tennessee, and I've been here for uh, all my life, uh, except for the 36 years I spent in the Marine Corps. And it is amazing the things that we have to do in order uh, to conserve the soil uh, against those extreme events. And why is that important? Well, you know, 25% of the carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere that generates uh, the climate change comes from the soil. So if we can do some things, if we can spend some money, if we can invest resources, if we can put the power of people's thought into uh, doing a better job of taking care of our soil and having it hold the uh, carbon rather than uh, give it out and to pull it back in. Uh, the Senate just passed a great bill that is gonna help address that if if it can become law, uh, where it will support uh, farmers and others that are seeking to be better stewards of the soil and to bring that carbon in and reduce the impact uh, that the soil degradation is having. I'll talk about another thing that uh, the military, going back, the military can do. Uh, when I was with uh, Admiral McGinn and the uh, Pentagon, uh, my job uh, was to uh, program money uh, for the Marine Corps budget. Uh, about that time, we were bringing in V-22s and, and starting a, a plan for the uh, introduction of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. And so we were starting to build a lot of stuff. <laughs> and you heard Admiral McGann talk about some of the damage that was done on the East Coast. One of our major air bases is Buford in South Carolina. If you look at what we did in terms of the money we're putting into that, almost a billion dollars for that base, and you look at what the flood impact is now when hurricanes come in, it is just one example of how we need to look within the Department of Defense where we're putting stuff uh, in order to be prepared uh, for the effects of climate change. How we can play our role in climate change. DOD is the largest single consumer 
of gas. Admiral McGinn and I spent our career turning liquid into gas, but we've got to do it on a much less uh, you know, state. We've got to reduce the amount we do. We've got to put other energy uh, sources in there that he talked about. Uh, so, you know, our national security is not just one player. You know, we cannot measure our national security in a number of airplanes and a number of ships and a number of the tanks, artillery pieces, or even the number of people that we have in the military. We must have a comprehensive, comprehensive plan on how we're going to one, deal with the effects today, and two, take measures uh, that are going to prevent the increase that's staring us in the face now if we don't do something. Uh, I for look many, forward for, to For many years, uh, General Castellaw and I have been hoping and praying, along with our fellow aviators, that we could figure out how to build a uh, solar-powered airplane and helicopter, because then we wouldn't have to fly at night or in bad weather. So <laughs> that's our goal. Especially as we got older. So anyway, I look forward to uh, the questions from uh, uh, from the moderator and as well as as from those in the audience. Uh, this is a tremendously important thing, and it's going to take all of us uh, to solve it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant General, for your very enlightening opening remarks. So for the last member of our panel, I um, will turn it over to Dr. King for his opening mm -hmm. remarks. Thank you so much, Leanne. So um, I am a professor of international affairs and conflict studies. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how events unfolding abroad can affect us and our national security within the United States. And so I think there's really three areas of climate security. There's mitigation, which is the tremendous opportunities that the Defense Department has to reduce emissions and improve war fighting. Um, then there's the adaptation, and adaptation affects the roles and the missions of the military. But there's really this third area, and that's consequences management. Um, and I call it consequences management of failure to adapt to climate change. So what happens then? Well, what happens is that the consequences are creating unmanageable geopolitical risk to the United States. And if that's true, what we really need to do is prepare for the threats that we already know are locked in. Um, I heard the last panelist talk, uh, the panel previous talking about the idea that even if we went down to zero emissions today, there'd still be some time when these changes are locked in. And so during this time, there's, we have to prevent major security disruptions um, and then really try to understand the scale of the global problem. So a few things about the scale of the global problem, um, just like the American West now is, is feeling the effects of drought and high temperatures. You know, the region that's probably the most affected by this now is the Middle East and North Africa, which is where I study. Um, so it's been pretty well documented that drought was a sort of a necessary but not sufficient condition that led to the contributing factors building up to the war in Syria. Um, climate related environmental migration is another issue. So climate change along with obviously poverty, you know, is a push factor for climate migration. And so um, these trends are already discernible in an area called the dry corridor of the um, of Latin America, um, Central America, where they're experiencing a combination of population growth, movement from rural to urban areas for farmers where the soil is no longer productive. And these people are moving into cities where there's a lot of existing violence. So there's now this poverty gap between ur urban and rural populations. And these people um, have a sense of growing desperation, which is causing them to move um, from Central America in this dry corridor into Mexico. And obviously they're putting pressure on the Southern border. And, and this is one of the issues we really have to look at. Um, another one that's important, I think, to US security is the Arctic region. You know, the melting of the Arctic is creating potential space um, for our adversaries to operate where they hadn't had that before. So Russia and China are moving to exert control. 
and the U.S. really is not prepared right now for Arctic missions. Um, it might have been discussed in other panels that we have very few icebreakers compared to the Russians. We have search and rescue operations that would be necessary um, as, the, as it opens up even to pleasure traffic with cruise ships. Um, and we're just not prepared right now for those missions. So what's the good news? The, the good news is that despite the unprecedented global threats, we really also, as the United States, have unprecedented foresight capabilities. So what are these capabilities? These are technological developments that have enabled the U.S. Um, to have some of the best predictive tools out there. Um, and what I mean by that is Earth observation platforms, satellites, forecasting, and the ability to use big data sets and artificial intelligence to drive climate models. Um, so we need to make our communities and, res and um, institutions more resilient to a broad range of these threats, but we have that capability to, and then also to share that with some of our allies. And so um, bringing these tools to bear has required the White House and the president to really foreground climate change as part of our national security agenda. Um, and, we've, and I think that's happening. And so on this point in September, 2019, over 60 military um, experts, intelligence experts, national security leaders formed the National Security Advisor, sorry, the Climate Security Advisory Group. And this was chaired by the Center for Climate and Security in partnership with the Elliott School, where I am. Um, and we held a series of meetings where we came up with this climate security plan for America. Um, and what's important to know about the plan was it was written in 2019 without president prejudice to who would be president. This was just to inform the incoming administration um, as climate change is a vital national security threat. And again, to um, fulfill this responsibility to prepare and prevent for the threats that I've already um, outlined a bit. And so just to get into the plan, it has four pillars. The first is leadership to demonstrate leadership on climate change. Next, to assess the climate risks. Third is supporting our international allies and partners, um, which I'll speak a little bit more to, and then preparing and preventing for the worst impacts of climate change. So demonstrating leadership, I think we're there with that. Um, we've rejoined the Paris Accords. Biden led this International Climate Leaders Summit, which had some good outcomes toward encouraging other nations to also up their emissions reduction pledges. Um, and in the area of assessing climate risks, we've called for robust and actionable intelligence assessments. And so I'm also happy to say that there has, the intelligence communities now been tasked with bringing back an intelligence assessment on the impacts of climate change. Um, and then importantly, in the areas of supporting our allies and partners, I think it builds our US national security here to bolster resilience of other countries abroad. So that was really a big part of the plan. And, and I think that that's starting to happen. And one way that that can happen more increasingly is investing in climate adaptation efforts within our development assistance programs. So USAID can spend more money on climate finance, for example, in vulnerable regions like perhaps Central America. Um, and so many of these uh, you know, recommendations that we've recommended through the plan have really been taken on board. So um, the idea of John Kerry now in the White House being elevated to cabinet status and also having status on the National Security Council has been very important. Um, and then also there were a handful of executive orders that were implemented right during the first couple of weeks of the administration. And so one was called tackling the climate, climate crisis at home and abroad um, that elevated and required agencies to come back um, within 90 days with strategies and implementation plans um, and can bring to really bring climate considerations more into their work. Um, also to encourage to understand the impacts of um, climate change on agencies infrastructure abroad. So this includes embassies, military installations, um, and then also reinstating this Obama era executive order, which rejuvenated the interagency working group on climate change and has brought in some new players into that conversation. So, um, you know, overall, I think that um, we've made a lot of progress 
there's a lot of um, progress to be made still in the Arctic, as I said, you know, in understanding some of the other national critical infrastructure that we have and what the impacts are of climate change on that in infrastructure. Um, say even the national electricity grid um, and, and some others that are, that are now being overwhelmed. So, you know, recognizing this, um, we have to meet three objectives. You know, the first is assessing the international security implications of climate change and climate migration, as I mentioned. You know, second is options for identifying and protecting the resettlement of climate migrants that might be coming from areas um, more affected by climate change. Um, and then to identify ways that the United States can work together to respond um, to climate change with supporting our allies and partners. And so, um, you know, that, that's a, all I have to say. It's just the idea that um, climate security needs to be foregrounded more on the foreign policy agenda. Um, there are so many things to worry about. There's the idea that we need to integrate our foreign policy and our climate adaptation policy along with the domestic infrastructure, rebuilding our own infrastructure. And so climate security is really competing with a lot of other issues on, on the agenda. Um, and so I, I just encourage us to continue to think that way and to sort of capitalize on the momentum both coming out of the White House and then some of this global momentum around solving the climate crisis as we come into the um, negotiations later in the fall in Glasgow um, and really make sure that climate security is integrated into those conversations. Well, thank you, Dr. King, for those very dynamic opening remarks. So right now I would like to remind our conference participants that they can ask questions to our panelists by using the chat function. So to begin our Q&A session, I'd like to ask a question to all of our panel members about the climate and security plan for America. So the plan was published in September 2019 by the Center for Climate and Security. And as it was mentioned, it was intended for either the uh, Trump or Biden administration. So with that in mind, I was wondering, what do you think has really changed since uh, the plan's publication? Um, like it's been highlighted before, uh, with the new administration, there's a lot of momentum. So if you could just elaborate on any changes that's been seen since 2019, that would be great. And um, maybe Vice Admiral, we can turn to you first for any Early. answer. Yeah, I, I think um, it's really important to recognize that a lot of uh, good actions were being taken by the states and by the private sector to decarbonize, if you will, a lot of our energy, especially electricity. The prices of, uh, for example, uh, clean energy like wind and solar uh, have gone down dramatically. The prices of storage, which are critical for intermittent uh, resources like solar and wind have come down and they're continuing to. The innovation of uh, how you put grids together, whether they're uh, large uh, grids, transmission and, and distribution grids, or microgrids, a lot of great application of information technology that is going into those. The ability for us to control uh, electricity demand, for example, uh, that is implemented by, or enabled, I should say, by information technology, ever-present uh, sensors that are more and more accurate and uh, and becoming more ubiquitous, and also those same types of, uh, of information technology devices that can control things. Uh, you know, everybody or many people are familiar with uh, the fact that you can uh, control your thermostat at home from your office or from your car uh, using your, uh, your personal uh, digital device, whether it's an iPhone or what have you. So a lot of things are going on. What has happened with uh, the, this administration is a unbelievably broad and deep focus on what we can do to turn these challenges into opportunities. This isn't a problem though that's gonna get solved in Washington. 
It's not going to get solved on Wall Street. It's not going to get solved uh, at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. All of those things and from a technology standpoint, from a policy standpoint, and a, uh, a financial standpoint have to come together. But uh, it's individual uh, citizens, it's individual companies, it's individual uh, states and, and locales, businesses that are really, really going to be able to take this challenge on in, in its many, many complex facets and turn them into opportunities for uh, better quality of life and better economic growth. Uh, it really, uh, we shouldn't be uh, so daunted by the uh, immenseness of the challenge that we feel uh, unable to uh, do anything about it. There's a lot we, we can do about it and a lot that we have been doing about it that we need to continue to scale and leverage. Thank you for that very um, positive answer. Um, so it sounded like you said that we need to focus on better economic growth and not be daunted by right. um, these challenges. Hmm. One, one of the things, uh, just a real quick editorial comment, um, we got to get beyond the politics on this. Mother Nature uh, is nonpartisan. Uh, she doesn't care what one party says or what the other party says. Mother Nature is Mother Nature. Climate change is climate change. And we in the national security business are used to having to deal with facts, objective facts, uh, analysis that uh, it helps to uh, define policies and technology choices, allocation of, uh, of critical uh, uh, resources, financial resources, we take it as it as it is, not the way we wish it were, and we deal with it in a way that uh, is going to maximize the opportunity for positive outcomes and try to manage risk at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Lieutenant General, same question for you. Do you have any insight or ideas on what has changed since the publication? of the Climate and Security Plan for America. I tell you, what I am starting to see is an acceleration of the change in the hearts and minds of, of our citizens, uh, particularly the, the ones that, that uh, have been conservative and have been reluctant to uh, embrace uh, climate change is really happening. Uh, I did a, uh, uh, a presentation uh, here in Tennessee not long ago on national security in the age of climate change. Great attendance, uh, much interest, questions, uh, and that is a sea change. And we see it in uh, our government officials, uh, the planning that's underway. Uh, in the bipartisan support on the Senate bill. Uh, so uh, I am seeing a definite movement in the right direction uh, by officials and by our citizens as they see clearly the impact that climate change is having. Where you're talking about the drought in the West uh, whether you're talking about the extreme uh, storms that have occurred in the in the Midwest, whether you're talking about the damage to our military installations on the East Coast and the Gulf, uh, these things are now clearly understood, and we're moving in the right direction at an increasing pace. That's the change I see. Thank you for that. Do you have any um, ideas or insight on a possible driver for that change? What has caused, as you said, the hearts and minds of our citizens and um, policymakers to shift? Well, uh, a lot of times the most important factor is the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there were 60 organizations uh, and that uh, uh, associations that endorsed that Senate bill. And uh, these were associations where their most important 
uh, role is to support uh, the economy of uh, rural America. And so they see that this is going to have an impact on increasing the viability of our economy. So when you're getting bread and butter things like that, and Admiral McGinn talked about the energy and Dr. King, uh, that uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, TVA is a sacred institution where I live. And, uh, they're getting out of the um, uh, out of the power plant business fueled by uh, coal, uh, and it's not based on on uh, a lot of uh, you know nice things. What it's based on is the fact that it's cheaper to run less uh, uh, energy that uh, is bad for the uh, environment. Uh, so wind energy uh, in the plains, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, solar panels are popping up. You know, I, I drove through Eastern North Carolina and it's so compatible uh, with the cotton corn, soybeans and cattle that are out there. We've been contacted in our little company about uh, the viability of, uh, of carbon farming uh, being consolidated with solar farms and wind farms. Uh, so uh, what we're seeing is self-interest, which is a good old American capitalism that is starting uh, to have that invisible hand move. And so I think that's, that's one of the primary factors. In I think also, Leanne, people are starting to feel uh, threatened in many ways. You know, we've discussed a whole variety of uh, things like drought, wildfires, uh, mm -hmm. floods, hurricanes, et cetera, tornadoes uh, tearing up the Midwest or the southeast part of the country. And people are saying, wow, this is getting uh, kind of close to home. It's not an abstract thing that a bunch of scientists and policymakers are talking about. They're really, they're really feeling a threat. People who have uh, lost electricity because of that ice storm, if you will, that uh, Texas experienced, or people uh, that uh, are suffering through um, widespread heat waves but don't have enough electricity to keep themselves cool, uh, that is a personal threat. And you couple that with what uh, General Castellan just uh, pointed out so, so well, it is in our personal and our economic self-interest to... Uh, to get it, to say, hey, I can't explain all of the all the scientific facts and all that stuff, but I do know I'm being affected and I, I don't like it. I want to do something about it so I can be more resilient or we can be more resilient as an individual or family or a company or a state or what or a nation. But uh, it's become very personal, personalized because of uh, all of these uh, symptoms that we're feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those answers. They make a lot of sense. And I agree 100% with both of them. So turning to Dr. King, the uh, same question, what do you feel has changed since the plans uh, publication in 2019? Yeah, so the most obvious change was really the fact that um, the United States did um, in accordance with one of the recommendations of the plan, you know, re-enter the Paris Accords. So that that's something that we've hoped would happen, but but weren't sure about. So that that's the biggest change. And so, but it's not just that we re-entered the Paris Accords. It's what role the United States intends to play within that regime and and how to make things better. And and so, um, I think what the United States is behind now is a little bit of the idea of. You know, we're, it's traditionally been an agreement around mitigation and, and clean energy, um, but also thinking a little bit more about how adaptation um, plays into it. So there's um, a provision called losses and damages, um, which is to reimburse, so to speak, countries that have been um, affected more than others. It has to do with common and differentiated responsibilities, meaning the countries that have contributed the most to the problem of emissions, therefore have some responsibility for the countries that have been impacted the most, like small island states. And so I was really um, gratified to see that the United States has um, re-established a commitment to something called climate finance, which is um, the multi 
um, billion dollar attempts to um, help people through help other countries through the multilateral development organizations to implement new climate adaptation projects in those countries. And I and we've pledged to um, devote more more funds to that as was called for under the agreement. So it's not just that we've rejoined the agreement. It's it's more the constructive way we're looking at it and thinking more about the impacts of climate change in, in relation to it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to ask a few questions based on the opening remarks that each of you asked. So um, starting with Vice Admiral, you talked about decarbonization and decarbonization and decarbonizing in the right way. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit in your mind, what would be the right way going forward? Sure. Um, well, we've got to understand that our energy security of all forms, our economic security, and our environmental or climate security are all linked together, all inextricably linked. And if you try to do something big in any one of those, and you don't really think through the consequences of the others, it can be really bad. So an example, if I am so single-minded focused on, uh, on climate change and environmental security, I could say, all right, no more fossil fuel. Shut, up, shut down all the gas pumps, natural gas, gasoline, diesel, coal, everything. Shut it down. Not so good in terms of uh, economic security. And our energy security might be okay. On, on the other hand, uh, you could say, by golly, we want to make uh, a lot of money for the nation and, and the whole value chain that is associated with fossil fuel. So we could say the heck with this uh, climate change stuff. It's all theory and fluff, but man, let the let the mines get going and the, and, the, and the drilling and all of that. So you need to balance it. So in order to recognize this is an existential threat caused by climate change, and it doesn't get easier to deal with each year that goes by. But we need to do it in a way that uh, takes into consideration, we've got to keep the lights on. We've got to make sure that we have energy reliability and resilience. We've got to make sure that people can afford, and not just individual people, individual persons uh, and, and families, but, uh, but companies. And, and uh, we need to take the economics of uh, this decarbonization into effect. So it's a it's a problem that we have to approach uh, holistically, and uh, and to do it with uh, the end in mind that every year that goes by, if we are able to produce more electricity, clean energy, uh, through energy efficiency, through renewable energy, through better storage mechanisms, through more efficient uh, grids, whether they're microgrids or mac macro grids. Uh, we're we're that much better off in terms of the reduction of greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. Great. And Lieutenant General, in your opening remarks, you talked about the important role that the military plays when responding to some of the challenges and threats of climate change. Could maybe you share your insight on how um, the military might shift their role going forward, or perhaps how it's changed over the past years? Well, uh, the military has a you know such a wide and deep uh, bench uh, to accomplish things, and so uh, a lot of times uh, we are uh, the default position when something happens. Uh, uh, we can uh, play key roles that are not, you know, responders or are uh, uh, doing the intelligence thing or uh, are uh, uh, creating technology. But that really is is collateral to what we're our primary mission is. Uh, and so uh, our mission is to defend this great nation of ours, and that has to be the focus. Now, there are things that we can do uh, that will uh, support that. Uh, one of the, when we're in, in the, doing operations, one of the most effective uh, task forces that uh, I have ever observed was in the Horn of Africa. And it was made up of a uh, 
well drilling team, National Guard from Guam and a uh, veterinarian from uh, Georgia. Uh, and of course, uh, the Sahil and is uh, impacted by uh, drought and uh, weather extremes and water is tough. Uh, the economy is based on goats and the particular place we were looking at. And uh, the team went in and drilled uh, a well closer to town where the uh, population had more uh, ability to get it and reduce the impact that the drought was having. The uh, veterinarian uh, vaccinated the goats. The mortality rate went down. Uh, the health of the goats uh, produced more offspring. Uh, and so uh, through that, uh, we uh, increased their economic well-being. We increased their confidence in the government and reduce the need for us to do any kind of combat operations. Uh, so, you know, those are the type of things that that we can do, uh, but it shouldn't be our primary uh, role. Uh, we need to do technology that reduces the amount of fuel we use uh, and along those lines, uh, but we can got to keep our eyes on the prize in the long run. Thank you. And Dr. King, in your opening remarks, you talked about the international consequences of climate change. We know that climate change is a threat multiplier. So in your opinion, what can the United States do to help our allies and our partners become more resilient to the effects of climate change? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, you, you mentioned threat multiplier, and, and I know that's something that Admiral McGinn will remember um, back in CNA in our first report um, for the Military Advisory Board. We came up with this idea of the threat multiplier, which was that there was already underlying um, cleavages or inequalities in a society. Um, but then climate change would come on top of that and, and multiply some of the underlying inequities and, and problems that were already existing in a fragile state and then make that even worse. Um, and then we graduated maybe by about 2010 um, with the Quadrennial Defense Review at the Defense Department into this other idea, which was called the instability accelerant. So there was already conflict happening out there. And then what happened was climate change came on as like an aggregate, an aggravating factor, and actually it was accelerating conflict um, in those regions. And so in 2014, the Military Advisory Board went back and looked at the original 2007 study, which came up with the threat multiplier, um, which by the way has been quoted six, 60,000 times in the scholarly literature now, the threat multiplier. Um, and they looked back at that in 2014 and said, right now, climate change is actually a catalyst for conflict. Um, and so if it's a catalyst for conflict, how can we engage our um, allies and partners, as you said, to try to avoid conflict? So we're thinking about it more, I think, in a conflict prevention mode um, than we had been before. And so what are the ways to... Um, to, to alleviate conflict was they say in the military, you know, left a boom. And so left a boom is really more of a development challenge. You know, that's something more that USAID um, using the development D of the three Ds, the three levers of foreign policy, defense, development, diplomacy. I really think it's something that the development um, actors can lead on. So, you know, there's something called the Global Fragility Act, um, which is under USAID. And that's the idea of more um, assistance to alleviate poverty um, where people are um, to ameliorate things like climate-based migration and to solve some of those problems at home. And, and so I think um, the Global Fragility Act is something that's a vehicle where um, we could really get behind and support um, the countries that are most fragile. And then quickly you said um, supporting allies and partners, I believe is part of the question. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. The, the, I spent a lot of time in the Netherlands um, talking to the, the military there and some of the conferences we've had. Um, and it's interesting that um, you really have to respect the security agendas of your allies, even if these issues aren't as high up on their agendas as they are on yours. 
So the Netherlands actually had a flood in 1952 where nearly 2,000 people perished after a storm um, um, compromised the dikes there. Um, and then also the Netherlands is a Caribbean nation because parts of the country, the kingdom that are not insular are actually in the Caribbean. So we have to listen to our allies and partners and respect their security agendas when they say this issue of climate change is extremely important to them. And we might not be feeling it quite the same way, but this is part of supporting and engaging allies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we only have a few minutes left. So for um, a concluding question, I would like to ask all of our uh, panelists to share what um, specific challenge of climate change keeps them up at night. What challenge of climate change is, in your opinion, the most uh, pressing right now? So Vice Admiral, we'll turn to you first. I, I think, Leanne, um, that the loss of um, economy or economic losses put another way, uh, some of the things that uh, General Castellan mentioned uh, is really a, a, a threat. We've got to do this right. Um, w w there was a great, uh, apparently, uh, meeting with the president among the uh, 10 bipartisan senators today at the White House in which they agreed on an infrastructure bill that was going to, in addition to simply fixing roads and bridges, as much as uh, we need to do that, and we do, but to actually do things in a way that are going to increase our climate resilience and reduce our greenhouse gas uh, footprint. So I would say the thing that we all ought to worry about is uh, uh, our individual and our community and our nation, national uh, economic well-being, because that is tied to everything. It's tied to personal health and security and quality of life. And uh, we need to get after it. And we can't waste uh, any time uh, debating anymore. We've got to apply the best technology, put the finance where it's going to get the greatest return on uh, investment and have the policies that enhance that, that technology and that money. And General Castella, your thoughts? Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Africa, Lake Chad Basin, Central African Republic, uh, Horn of Africa, and other places, uh, Rwanda. Uh, the greatest near-term uh, challenge is going to be uh, dealing with the impacts of uh, migration uh, caused by uh, extreme weather and drought and so forth. It's extremely destabilizing and uh, eventually, uh, if we are not able to deal with it uh, will become an acute national security issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. King. Yeah, I'll be brief because I know we're really approaching the end of the hour here. So uh, I believe that water scarcity or water stress is the most sort of immediate and visceral impact of climate change. And so just as the United States West is experiencing a, a shortage and increasing drought, um, there are a lot of other countries where there's a lot of instability um, that are in even worse shape in terms of water stress. And so one that I think of is Egypt, um, where there's an unfolding crisis there with the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam um, not, not allowing the, the flow of the Nile the way it would. And then some of the other impacts of climate change coming together, reinforcing the problem that General Castle just brought up, which is um, uncontrollable migration. Well, it looks like we have reached the end of our session. I would like to thank each of our panelists for um, their comments and their very in insightful answers to our questions. So um, it looks like we will now turn it over. Yeah, Unless, I, I got it, uh, Lynn. Go okay. Ahead. <laughs> yeah. Terrific. Thanks so much, Leanne. Thanks so much to that panel for that really interesting and relevant discussion um, about what a national climate security plan for America might look like, what we need to do.